Good evening, and thank you for joining Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan's virtual telephone town hall. My name is Mike Anderson, and I'm tonight's moderator. Now, tonight we have some special guests on the line with us from the Alaska Department of Labor who will be helping us answer some questions as well. And in just a few moments, I'll be turning the call over to the senators for a few brief opening remarks. But before that, I'd like to remind everyone that for anyone that would like to ask a question tonight, please press star 3 at any time, and you'll be connected with an operator. Again, if you'd like the opportunity to ask a question this evening, please press star 3 to enter the queue. With that, I'll turn the call over to Senator Murkowski. Senator? Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all, all Alaskans that have joined us on the line this evening. This is the fourth Teletown Hall that Senator Sullivan and I have uh, hosted uh, every Thursday, we've been joining Alaskans for, for an hour or so. Uh, last weekend, we focused on small business loans and, and access through the CARES programs. And tonight, we're going to, to try to give a little focus on, on unemployment and the unemployment benefits available from the state and the federal government. We know that as as Alaskans have been impacted by businesses uh, shutting down uh, literally a whole tourist uh, season um, or gone, uh, just great anxiety about their ability to pay the rent, uh, meet the mortgage, um, just pay the bills. There is a great deal of anxiety, um, and, and, and people are, are notably concerned. They see that we have moved federal legislation to, to help address uh, not only their individual situation, uh, but, but businesses, uh, big and small. And they've got a lot of questions about that. So these town halls are designed to, to hopefully uh, hear some of your questions and, and provide answers about how we can uh, address many of the issues that you're facing. Uh, for those of you uh, who follow the Anchorage Daily News, you saw the headline, uh, today more than 60,000 Alaskans have apply, applied for unemployment benefits. I think we recognize that, uh, that the surge that we have, have seen um, is one that is, is brought about um, because of, again, the extraordinary economic impact that we are seeing. And in, the, in an effort to, to address uh, some of the, the, the fiscal constraints and, and just uh, really the, the, the concerns that families are having, combining the state unemployment benefits with a plus up on the federal side for a period of weeks going forward uh, was part of what we addressed within the CARES Act. Prior to the CARES Act, we, we put in place mechanisms within the Family First Act uh, to help Americans who are now unemployed, furloughed, laid off, those who've, been, who've seen their work hours reduced because of the pandemic. So uh, there's many issues that I know Alaskans may have, whether it's concerns about the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, the economic injury program, the uh, direct assistance programs for individuals. There are, are many questions out there. We'd like to try to focus tonight on, on unemployment, but when we get to the questions and answers, uh, the floor is yours, so ask what you will. But I do want to uh, tap into the expertise that we have tonight. We have the Alaska Labor Commissioner, Tamika Ledbetter, we also have Patsy Westcott, who's the director of the Employment and Training Division, which also oversees Alaska Unemployment Insurance Program. So they have uh, graciously agreed to be on the call with us tonight. Neither the commissioner nor Director Westcott will be able to answer specific questions about individual Alaskans' unemployment applications. And that's just simply a privacy issue. It would violate your, your privacy and require them to look into your files right here on the town hall, which they can't do. But they are prepared to answer 
many of the questions about how they and their staff are working hard to meet Alaskans' needs during this stressful time and, and perhaps what we can all expect going forward. So hopefully you will um, be able to, to gain some, some further information on this call this evening. I'll turn to my colleague, Senator Sullivan, and thank him for, for his relentless efforts as we're trying to be responsive to Alaskans' needs and for being uh, on the call with all of you tonight. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Murkowski, and um, good evening, Alaska. And again, I want to thank everybody for taking time out to uh, join us on this Teletown Hall. What we've been trying to do on these is to get as much information out to uh, as many Alaskans as possible. Take your questions that you ask here, and then if you don't have the opportunity to have a question asked during the Teletown Hall, uh, take your question down afterwards with some of our team members and be able to try to get back to you on some of your questions. There's no doubt we are going through unprecedented times right now. I've uh, talked a bit about this pandemic more like a natural disaster or a war. It's also becoming an economic disaster for our state and our country. And as Senator Murkowski noted, the Anchorage Daily News article uh, just yesterday about 60,000 Alaskans applying for jobless benefits. The numbers, of course, across the country are in the millions. Is a shocking and even horrifying number, particularly given where we were both as a state and a country just two months ago in February where we had some of the un lowest unemployment rates in our history. But we are where we are. And so we're going to get through this together. Uh, we're working closely with the governor and his team, the president and his team, one team, one fight, as I like to say, in the Marine Corps. And one of the things that we recognize is the CARES Act, which was passed about three weeks ago, and then the, essentially the CARES Act 2.0, which we passed in the Senate two, de two nights ago in the House just passed and will be signed, I believe, tomorrow by the President, are programs that are trying to provide massive resources to our citizens across different areas. For example, small business, to our fishermen, to our tribes, to our state and local communities. And importantly, in the focus of tonight's uh, Teletown Hall is with regard to unemployment insurance. Any legislation that is this large and um, put together quickly, and it was because we wanted to try to get out the resources to our fellow Alaskans and Americans as quickly as possible, recognizing the magnitude of this pandemic, uh, is going to have glitches, it's going to have snafus, it's going to have problems in the implementation. <clears throat> Our job is to try to answer the questions, hear from all of you, try to fix some of these to the extent possible at the implementation level, and then also work with individual Alaskans. We have a great team out there who can try to provide resources. Uh, can't promise solutions to all the challenges, but certainly we will try to get back to you as quickly as possible if you have individual questions. Uh, in particular, some of the programs in the CARES Act, we were focused on getting resources out as quickly as possible so as not to create new giant federal bureaucracies that were cumbersome and wouldn't work. So for example, on the Paycheck Protection Program, which we just uh, replenished with about $310 billion for small businesses, the way in which that is deployed uh, the money is not through any new uh, SBA bureaucracy or federal government bureaucracy, but through our local community banks and credit unions. Similarly, uh, but maybe a little bit more in a more complicated way, as Senator Murkowski mentioned, the CARES Act has a very significant plus-up of the unemployment insurance uh, program payments and coverage 
for Americans uh, with regard to the federal side of the program. However, it is implemented through the state of Alaska uh, Department of Labor and Unemployment Insurance Office. So that is why we are so pleased to have uh, Commissioner Ledbetter and the Division Director uh, Westcott to help answer the questions tonight because this is truly an example of a federal program, state program <clears throat> integrated. And like I said before, of course, there's going to be snafus, glitches, particularly as these two different programs, state and federal, come together. But I'm very pleased that we have um, two of the top officials in the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development who essentially will be leading the charge on this program that in many ways, unfortunately, because of the large number of unemployed we have across the state and across the country is going to be so, so important. So I will end by just thanking both of them. I was just talking to Commissioner Ledbetter. She has two sons in the U.S. Marine Corps, which is an incredible accomplishment in terms of her own military service but and that of her husband's and that of her children. So uh, we're honored to have her. And I just want to thank all of our fellow Alaskans for the hard work that you are all doing, the self-sacrifice that we're all doing as a state, as a country, uh, to get through these challenging times, which we will, stronger and more resilient. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do, and our job as your delegation in Congress is to provide as many resources through as many channels, whether individuals, families, unemployed workers, small businesses, fishermen, to get us through this crisis um, and get us back on a strong economic road to recovery and a doing it in a way that protects the health of Alaskans. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, with that, we'll go with uh, the Alaska Commissioner of Labor, uh, Dr. Tamika Ledbetter. The floor is yours. Hello, and thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Sullivan, and to uh, Senator Murkowski. Greetings to you and to everyone on the line this evening. Um, I do appreciate uh, both senators' comments, and, and I agree this is one team and, and we have one fight. And so I really do appreciate having this opportunity this evening to provide an update on the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development's response to COVID-19. We all have witnessed the economic disruptions caused by the coronavirus pandemic, and we've heard about the strain uh, the unemployment insurance systems across the country are experiencing. My team is working around the clock to get resources to Alaskans, Alaskans and they're doing a remarkable job under enormously extenuating circumstances. As you mentioned earlier, Senator, we went from record low unemployment to record high unemployment literally overnight. And so during the month of March, it should be noticed, uh, noted, um, noted that Alaska's Unemployment Insurance Division saw a 632% increase in filings compared to the month of March just last year. We've onboarded to mitigate some of that 120 new staff, and we plan to hire another 120 over the next few weeks. So far, we've processed more than 57,000 claims, and we've released just under $83 million in payments. And so this week, we've begun to process applications for those who are self-employed, and we're looking forward to assisting those who are um, a part of the gig economy or they're independent contractors or self-employed as they seek relief during this time. And so I don't want to take up too much time with uh, opening remarks, but I do appreciate this opportunity to participate in the Tully Town Hall tonight. And I'll turn it over to Director Westcott, who does oversee our unemployment <coughs> insurance operations. And she and her team are doing a fantastic job. And we want to do everything we can to answer questions this evening and see how we can assist uh, UI applicants and claimants to get through our system and process applications. 
Director Westcott? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Commissioner Ledbetter. Uh, this is Patsy Westcott, Director of the Division of Employment and Training Services. I also don't want to take up too much time in opening comments because I know that many of you out there listening have call or have questions and we need to respond to those questions. But I do want to take this opportunity to thank the Honorable Senator Murkowski and the Honorable Senator Sullivan for this opportunity for the department <clears throat> to, um, to, to be able to talk to Alaskans about what the department is doing in order to um, address uh, the needs of Alaskans at this time and, and, and the influx of unemployment claims that have come our way. A few things that I do want to say before we turn it over to questions. Uh, as uh, both Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan spoke to, uh, and with their support, the CARES Act passed. And there were a number of provisions within that act that impacted the unemployment insurance program. And so I just want to give a brief update of where we are at with implementing those. So one of those was the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, which added $600 to uh, regular unemployment weekly benefit amounts. And so we have been able to get that up and running in Alaska, and those payments are going out the door. We are working very hard to get the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program up and running. We're really encouraged and excited about where we are in our progress with that uh, program. This is the program that is going to provide economic relief to the self-employed and the independent contractors and gig economy workers. And so we are, as Commissioner Ledbetter indicated, we are taking applications for that program at this time, and we anticipate being able to release payments on that program within the next couple of weeks. So we're really excited about that. And then, um, and then the third and final uh, is the um, Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation, and that is the provision in the CARES Act that provides 13 weeks of additional compensation uh, to individuals that had a, uh, a, a regular unemployment uh, benefit claim. And so we are working very hard to get both of those up and running. Um, <clears throat> and with that, I will stop with my comments so that we can answer as many questions as we can. All right, thank you, Director Westcott. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to some questions here. But once again, just to remind our listeners, uh, if you're looking to ask a question tonight, please press star 3 to be placed into the queue. Again, that's star 3 to be placed into the queue. Uh, we're going to start with Mark in Seward, who has a question for the Senator. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, uh, Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan. Thank you for taking my call. I'm an employer in Seward. Um, I have a hotel, a restaurant, and a bar. I also have two other colleagues that have been calling me daily. Between us, we probably represent 400 employees. And all three of us as business owners are concerned that what happened to me, and that is, is that I have employed full-time during this period of time all my employees. I have furloughed a single person that hasn't come to me and asked to be furloughed so that they could collect unemployment. Now, I did get a PPP loan, and I'm in the process of hiring them back, the, the ones that said that they were afraid and needed to be laid off. I have no customers. I'm covering it, was covering it out of my pocket. My other friends, the same thing with 400 employees, and they are having a hard time competing with unemployment at, let's say our average employee is $15 an hour, they make $2,400 a month at 40 hours a week. On unemployment, they're able to get $2,400 plus, um, at least this is my understanding from the employees that quit on me or didn't quit, asked to be laid off because they were fearful of the facility and their other employees, not even my customers. What do I do now because I'm gonna pay this loan back or, or get forgiven, but I have to maintain 75% of my employees 
with 75% of my payroll, and I'm having an awful difficult time getting to come off of unemployment to come working for me. I just read, read an article that, that said that in many states that this might be an issue um, that if people are offered gainful employment and refuse it, they won't get unemployment. Is that true? Uh, and and but I but I don't want to I don't want to hurt anybody. I just need employees. That's Senator, an excellent Senator, question. Excellent question, and and we're going to tag team on that one. Um, first of all, we want to say to you, you're not the only one, sir, that that has mentioned that to us, and the department is taking that very seriously. If an employee has worked and has the opportunity to be recalled to work and chooses not to just to collect unemployment insurance, that is fraud, and we take that very seriously. And Director Westcott, do you want to jump in there on that one? Yes, I would like to. Um, thank, th thank you so much, Commissioner Ledbetter. I, I definitely want to speak to this. So it is a long-standing foundational principle of the unemployment insurance program that an individual is unemployed through no fault of their own. And second, the second part of that is that they are able and available for work. And so, so for those workplaces, uh, and, and this week the governor uh, started uh, announcing his first phase of reopening business in Alaska. And so for those workplaces that are reopening, if work is available, and work is refused without good cause, and those individuals file for unemployment insurance, that is fraud. And there are penalties, severe penalties, for fraudulent activity against the program. We want, as, as a program, we want to know that. There is information on our website about how to report that to us. There are several numbers that you can call depending on your location, and there is an email address out there on our website about how to report that. Mark, I think what you've heard there is, is so very, very important. I, I am hearing uh, iterations of, of what you have, have asked here from so many who are very concerned about their ability to get their own um, employees back on if they've if they've have had to furlough them or to keep them on because of the increased benefits. Um, this just so you know the the background. I'll keep brief because I I want to get to more questions. But this is something that was raised just before passage of the initial CARES Act. The concern that you might with with expanded unemployment benefits. You might actually have situations where uh, an employee would be earning more on unemployment than they were uh, at their initial job, and that it would create a disincentive uh, to, to go back to work. There was pretty extended debate on that. Uh, it was actually the only amendment that we uh, uh, took a roll call vote on with the CARES Act. Um, and the, the amendment was to, to address just this. It failed. I had supported the amendment. Uh, Senator Sullivan did as well. But it is it is a concern that was recognized. And and again, I think what you saw happen towards the uh, the end of passage of this bill was it was a it was a very rushed effort to try to um, deal with the immediacy of the matters that we had in front of us. I do believe that this is this is. A, a significant issue um, uh, in the in the short term here, and 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 something that uh, we we have to look at what we have put in place in terms of unintended consequences here. Now, I suppose that the one thing to keep in mind is that these expanded um, uh, unemployment insurance benefits do not continue throughout the. Uh, the the emergency. Uh, there is a time limit on on this uh, additional uh, $600 expanded payment. Um, it is for it is for four months and then it expires. Um, but it 
what you're speaking to is what I have heard from many, many, many of our small business employers um, that want to be able to take advantage of the forgiveness of the PPP, but in order to do so, you've got to have those employees on, and it has put, uh, it has put an extraordinary um, bind in what I think was well-intentioned, uh, not only on the on the small business loan side, but also on on the additional assistance for UI. And Mark, it's uh, Dan. It's, it's, it's Dan. I, I don't want to belabor this. You heard the the really good points. Just the one. So you, you had a sense of the debate that we had on the Senate floor. There was a recognition of the problem, as Senator Murkowski mentioned. There was an amendment that essentially would would have tried to create. Uh, would have enforced uh, essentially a formula to make unemployment insurance with the additional federal benefit that that employee whole as it relates to their current wage, not uh, paying them more than they made uh, when they were employed. Uh, the argument, and, and Senator Murkowski and I both voted for that because we thought it made sense to avoid the problem that you're talking about right now. The argument against it, just so you know what the debate was, uh, was that there was a number of uh, you know, uh, unemployment insurance offices in the state that said that makes sense, but it might take a really, really long time to get that amount out to people, weeks or even months, because it's kind of a complicated formula. And so uh, the, that, that uh, that argument won out. Uh, the amendment that we supported did not pass, which I think would have mitigated the problem you're talking about. And as a number of us thought, it, it has created a disincentive that we need to continue to look at. I know it's put people like you in a tough spot. Uh, All right. Senator, uh, Senators Murkowski and Sullivan, can, this is Director Westcott. Um, uh, just if I could just add one more thing, and that is, that we will actively pursue every situation. And so we really do want employers to report to us when these situations occur. We understand that there may be an incentive there for individuals not to return to work. And that is not the purpose of the unemployment insurance program. And so I just want to encourage the employer community, for those of you that are going through this situation, to please report to, to report those situations to us. We will actively pursue those situations. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Next up, we're going to go to Grant on the Kenai, who's got a question for the Senators. Uh, thank you. I'm a small business owner on the uh, Kenai Peninsula. Currently, I cannot open under the uh, <clears throat> governor's guidelines. I did receive a PPP loan. So if I, if I cut a check for my employees to kind of help them along before I open, are they required to go off of their Alaska UI? Well, this is Director Westcott. And if an individual is receiving wages, whether they are working or not, if they are receiving wages, they are not eligible for unemployment insurance. Okay, thank you, Director. Next up, we're going to go to Wynn in Fairbanks, who has a question. Hi, this is Wynn. Um, I had a question on unemployment for self-employed. Uh, workers. I'm self-employed as a hairdresser in Fairbanks, and um, I've been off since the governor mandate mandated in March 21st, and now he's released that mandate, and we can go back to work starting tomorrow. Um, but I haven't. I've been trying to apply for unemployment, even though it wasn't quite set up for self-employed, and now we're going back, and I haven't been able to receive anything this last month. So I was just curious if it was possible for retrograde pay, back pay or how that works. So this is Director Westcott, and mm -hmm. yes, the, the, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, okay. We will back pay 
uh, claims depending on an individual circumstances and depending on when an individual lost employment versus when they are able to go back to work. So does that answer your question, I hope? Um, yes. Can you maybe direct me to where I can learn how to apply? I mean, because I've applied for the regular unemployment, but it's not the same as for, I mean, it, it's not set up for self-employed, so I don't know if I did it right, and I, so where can sure, I, that, or when, Sure, the, so this is Director Westcott, and thank you mm -hmm. for applying for regular unemployment insurance, because that is the first test, is whether or not you qualify for regular unemployment insurance. Our intent mm -hmm. is for those individuals that don't qualify for regular unemployment insurance, we intend to take that data, and we intend mm -hmm. to do a cross match over to the new system that we're setting up for the pandemic unemployment assistance program, which is the program to help those individuals that are self-employed. So at this point, you've done everything right, and we will, if we need any additional information from you, we will be in touch with you. And, and what I, the other thing that I would say is that we intend to issue additional guidance uh, in the form of a press release and on our website within the next day or two. All right, thank you, Director. Uh, hey, Mike, hang on, Mike. Was yep. Just real quick, because I think Wynn has a really important question. And so, because my understanding, and Director Westcott, maybe you can just help clarify this. So she, she's unemployed for a month. She okay. is part of the federal CARES Act, because she's an independent contractor, which, or self-employed which we made sure was covered on the federal side, which may not have been mm -hmm. covered on the state side. Mm -hmm. so, um, so Director Westcott, what Wynn is supposed to do is to apply uh, and, 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 and uh, make sure she kind of continues to, to uh, monitor that, start back working, but she still gets... Um, a month's worth of unemployment that would include the additional money as well? Is that is that yeah, what she should yeah. do, and is that how that would work for her? Yes, thank you, Senator Sullivan, for that question. That's an excellent question. And yes, that is correct. For that for that period of time where, where this sector of our population, which, which isn't, it's not a sector that the regular unemployment insurance program has ever covered before, and that is the self-employed, independent contractors, and gig economy workers. And so there was a period of time where those individuals could not work. And during that period of time where they could not work, despite the fact that maybe now we were, are in this situation where um, as the governor said earlier this week, we, we are going to reopen Alaska's economy and, and so some of those businesses can reopen. There is a period of time where those individuals could not work. We are able to pay those individuals during that period of time. And, and so thank you for that question. Yes. She, Even she though she might still, go back to work next week. That is correct, sir. Okay, good. Okay, thank you for that discussion. Next, we're going to go to Dwayne in Sitka, who's got a question. Uh, yeah, um, a few of my questions already got answered from some of the comments, but um, I have a question. It's not related to uh, unemployment insurance, but uh, more related to the insurance that um, I pay for for um, a disaster, you know, loss of uh, business insurance. And we have employee 18 people bought a million dollars of insurance if there was a, a, a disaster that, you know, like a fire or something like that, any, any type of disaster um, that they would reimburse up to, you know, a million dollars for um, the business being close. Um, my insurance company uh, doesn't see this as one of those disasters. Um, is this uh, normal or... Um, is this something that is going to be litigated? Does anybody know anything about that? Well, I, I do not. I, I find it hard to believe that uh, uh, 
disaster or, or, or loss of business insurance um, wouldn't qualify. This would not qualify. This is this is not only a state disaster. This is a national disaster um, uh, declared at all levels. So. Uh, you know, without knowing the specifics of what that insurance policy uh, is, it, it's hard to, to to give you more than that. But it just doesn't seem right based on what you have said. Uh, I I think we'd be happy to to talk to you about it. But um, you're raising something that is 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 new as far as I've heard. I don't know if Dan, you've heard anything on this, but. This doesn't seem right. Well, I, I yeah. would say, Dwayne, two things. I, I mean, obviously, I um, we haven't seen the contract. I think some of these uh, some of these insurance contracts have. I don't know if they have specific language on pandemics, but some actually do, um, where uh, where where they don't cover it, but again, I haven't seen it, and I, don't, I haven't seen yours. The one thing you can do, if you haven't already, is apply for the uh, SBA economic disaster loans, and the 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 uh, 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 emergency disaster loans and the economic disaster loans. We just plus that up two days ago in the CARES 2.0 legislation. And um, uh, that's something that you, you can do, and I would recommend that you do do. Uh, that's the program that, you know, even for the application, even if you don't get the loan, which it sounds like you should, um, is that uh, you, you, you get a grant up to $10,000 just on the application process. So. Uh, we're tracking that closely, Alaska, for whatever reason, and we're still, I, I wrote and communicated with the head of the SBA today, we did not get many of these EIDL loans in the state, but we got a lot of upfront payments, grants, like I just mentioned, uh, over, I think, 10, or over 1,000 or 1,200. But the force majeure issue that I mentioned, I think is becoming a large issue. Uh, litigation issue um, because uh, there's a number of folks that my understanding is that on insurance coverage like yours, uh, restaurant chains and others, retailers are um, being denied uh, insurance disaster relief for these force majeure clauses. So I think it is going to be litigation. But on the EIDL, I would, uh, as soon as this legislation is signed into law tomorrow, uh, I would I would apply for that. Okay, thank you. thank you, Senator. Next up, we're going to go to Vicki in Anchorage, who's got a question. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Um, two questions on the uh, emergency relief. I applied for it direct, like, two days into it and received no assistance through that. I've applied for unemployment. We're a sole proprietor. My husband, myself, uh, run the business. And pretty much from March until who knows when, we've lost all of our business because it's uh, tourist related. Um, and so basically, we've had to refund twelve or $13,000 to uh, people that had already booked. We we fully refunded all of those guests. But now we you know, like we have no relief at all. So I call the unemployment office. Under uh, my application, it shows monetarily uh, monetarily insufficient, I think is the term for the uh, people that are with the state labor force. Um, and so I call. They said that the, uh, the unemployment office would be contacting us or asking us questions. Should we call next week? to answer anything that they need from us to be able to get the relief of the 600 a week. Thank you. So this is, and well, thank you for the question. This is Director Westcott. Uh, so as far as 
the, the self-employment program, which is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Again, we are in the process of getting that program um, stood up. We are accepting applications for that program um, this week, and we hope to have uh, benefit uh, payments out the door within the next couple of weeks. As far as a small business loan, if, if that's what you're asking about, I, I can't respond to that. That would be, a, I think, a Department of Commerce um, question. But as it relates to unemployment insurance and the, uh, and the benefits that are available to the self-employed, um, again, we are, we are getting that program up and running. If you applied for regular unemployment insurance, we are going to take that data over into the new system that we are standing up for the self-employed. And if we need additional information, um, we will certainly be sending out notification that we need more information in order to qualify you. So and, Vicky, and sorry, you, oh, you go ahead. signed up for the um, uh, for the emergency um, uh, disaster loan, the EIDL. Were you given any kind of a of a number or an acknowledgement? Did you receive anything uh, uh, from? Uh, your lender SBA on that. She 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 dropped off, Senator. Or she did because if if in fact if in fact uh, she was able to, uh, to to have her application recognized, um, and it was just a function of the program uh, running through all of the money that we had. Uh, authorized for it, uh, with the action that that the Senate and the House have taken, and that the President will sign in, that fund, as Senator Sullivan has mentioned, will be replenished. And uh, the word that we had from SBA last week was that those who are quote in the queue will not have to reapply. But they did suggest that it would be important to just check back in with your lender to, to verify that everything was still in that lineup. Uh, if, if she had not received an acknowledgement or nothing had happened with that, uh, it would be timely to go ahead and, and reapply as soon as that application comes back online. It's my understanding that during this past week when uh, there were no funds uh, in either the PPP or the EIDL, uh, it was not possible to submit any application. Hopefully, that will be back up tomorrow uh, as a function of, of passage of this legislation. And, and I would just say, uh, Vicki, it sounds like you may have, but if you, if you are applying for or still looking at the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, you should, I would encourage you to apply for that if you haven't already done so. Again, it got, it got stopped last week because the funds ran out, but the funds will start flowing again uh, probably as early as tomorrow when, when, once the president signs the legislation. Okay, thank you. Next up, we're going to go to Jay and Ketchikan. Jay's got a question. Hi. Hello, folks. Thank you, senators. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, people, for doing such a great job. My questions mo mostly have been answered. I am a sole proprietorship, self-employed jewelry art store in Ketchikan. Our season is done for the whole year because I don't think we are going to get cruise ships. We've applied for unemployment and we get the same answers that we are monetarily ineligible. So we've got the answer. You've answered that question. My second question is the governor said they received 1.25 billion state aid from the SBA or from the CARES Act, and he earmarked $300 million for small business loans. How do we apply for those loans? Because we are a brick and mortar store, and our store rents are six, 7000 a month. We pay for 12 months. I've been here 24 years and never had to get a handout and never had to be in this situation. And EIDL, you applied for that? We've got $1,000. I got my grant, but we haven't heard about the loan. 
PPP, my bankers are still working on it. So what is the recourse we have going forward? I mean, there are 150 stores between Sitka, Skagway, Juno, and Ketchikan mm -hmm. that rely on cruise ships. And with the CDC and with the state, with the national uproar about cruise ships not being able to unload in ports, a lot of people won't take those cruises. So what do we do? Where do we go? Well, Jay, your your question is, uh, your statement is is right on the money here. You're speaking for a lot of people that we have heard from. It sounds like you are are clearly trying to take advantage of of, of what we have put out there with application to the PPP and the EIDL. If you've got the grant, that is the first step. And so now that uh, again we've replenished this. Um, uh, the, the hope is that these EIDL loans will, will start getting uh, moved out through through the other end. Um, in fairness, it has been uh, uh, almost shocking to see that the state of Alaska has received one finally approved EIDL loan. One. Um, obviously, we look at that and say there's there is a there's a, a flaw, there's a shortcoming, and, and, and we're attempting to get to the bottom of that so that this next round, we're not in that same, same situation. I think it is important to note that uh, with this additional funding of, of the plus-up of the PPP, there is a specific carve-out of $60 billion to go to smaller lenders, uh, lenders whose, whose asset size um, uh, is, is, is smaller. The thought is that they've got established banking relationships with, with smaller businesses. And so um, let's make sure that we are making um, available those funds to our, our true small businesses, of which we have so, so many in the state of Alaska. With regards to, uh, to the uh, $300 million that the governor has um, outlined in his response funding using the state stabilization uh, a, account. Um, it's my understanding that uh, that relief is going to be made available through AHFC, uh, ADA, and uh, uh, over at the Department of Commerce, uh, Community and Economic Development with regards to their existing loan program. Um, uh, so I don't know whether whether Commissioner Ledbetter can speak to to that uh, aspect of the state um, uh, state loans, but um, this is this is a recognition that uh, not only throughout Southeast, but uh, we're a state that is so heavily reliant on on the tourism sector, on the visitor industry for so many of our of our small businesses and operations. And so in addition to the direct assistance to individuals and to businesses, um, we're, we're, we're trying to ensure that we'll have a level of economic recovery. But it is, it is a, a, I think, a reality for so many that this season um, uh, is going to be extraordinarily challenging for far, far too many Alaskans. Senator, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, because of the way our industries are so closely aligned, this certainly makes it additionally challenging for small business owners and those that rely very heavily on our um, seasonal uh, tourism industry. And so we're working feverishly, the Department of Labor in collaboration with uh, Department of Commerce and the Governor's Office to try to come up with ways to to facilitate and mitigate some of the strain that this um, pandemic has placed primarily on our industries here in Alaska. And I believe uh, there will be more information forthcoming concerning that. But can I just add and maybe ask a question for Jay? So as a sole proprietorship, he can apply for the federal unemployment uh, insurance program if, uh, if he wants to do in the EIDL loan, which uh, he should, in a PPP loan. And um, one of the things, Jay, you should know that we're working on, and uh, I was uh, in 
communication with the Secretary of the Treasury again today on this issue is trying to enable uh, particularly our seasonal businesses like yours to apply for a PPP loan based on the amount of employees you had last summer, not the amount you have now. Now it sounds like with yours maybe that won't make a difference, but as you can imagine with some of our some of our bigger uh, uh, some of the small businesses that really ramp up employment in the summer and don't have a lot now, uh, getting regulations from the Treasury that enables that will enable the PPP loans for small businesses that are seasonal in Alaska to be bigger. And we've been pressing that hard. And I do want to say, and I've heard this from so many uh, Alaskans like you who I'm, I'm sure have been working your tail off for years building your business. Uh, you know, I wouldn't view any of this as a handout. Uh, there's nobody who did anything wrong. This is more like a natural disaster. I've been referring this as a, you know, business uh, interruption insurance. Or, uh, you know, there's so many hardworking Alaskans who have just gotten nailed with this through no fault of their own. That's the whole thing here. That's why we're trying to surge as many resources as possible. But I would encourage uh, looking at all of these programs, and again, maybe for Director Westcott, let's assume Jay does get a PPP loan, then he would, then he would have to stop receiving unemployment insurance. But in the meantime, the advice I've been hearing is that uh, they should apply. Is, is that what you would advise him? Yeah. So thank you, Senator Sullivan. That is an excellent question, and and so I'm I'm not really truthfully up to speed on the on the PPE program. What I would say is this. Any self-employed independent contractor or gig economy worker that normally doesn't qualify for regular unemployment insurance, I would encourage them to apply for the unemployment benefits that the CARES Act provided under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. And, and we, as a department, will work through those eligibility issues. And so I would encourage him to apply, absolutely. The sole proprietorships are clearly covered under the CARES Act. Yes. Uh, again, I would encourage any self-employed, independent contractor, or gig economy worker to apply. Uh, that 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 that's why the pandemic unemployment assistance program was provided for under the CARES Act, and that that is what we are working on. That that's the business that we are in is to get that program up and running and to get those benefits paid. So yes, I would encourage anyone to apply that doesn't qualify for regular unemployment insurance. Okay, thank you. Next up, we're going to go with Marilyn from Homer, who's got a question. Hi there, this is Marilyn. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so um, kind of in relation to, well, all of it, I guess. Uh, we're a small business that has some year-round and has an influx. We bring it, we're in tourism, so we bring in more in the summer. So two questions. Some of our team, your round team, we've had to um, either lay them off. That was clear. Some we've ha we've been able to just reduce their hours so they have something coming in. Um, and under the understanding that if your if their hours are reduced, they still can eventually also get the federal support of 600 an hour till we can get them back up to full speed of hours, and we have new hires or uh, rehires who come on seasonally that we can't hire so far yet financially and don't have a need so far uh, with uh, work. Are they, I'm hearing all of the, I understand the un, unemployed who qualify for unemployment, the self-employed, the gig workers, and the independent contractors, but there's this in-between group that are employees, but they don't qualify for unemployment. 
because they're not going to get hired and not they aren't they were hired but they were we you know we agreed to hire them and then some that we've reduced their hours that are there's nowhere on the Alaska website that tells them that, that they're actually still included in the CARES Act. Are they? So this is Director Westcock, and if it's okay, I'd like to speak to that. So anyone that is employed less than full time, I am encouraging them to apply for unemployment insurance benefits. Any wages that they earn, that they do earn during a week would be deducted from their regular unemployment insurance benefit amount. With that said, as long as their entitlement for the week is still at least $1 of regular unemployment insurance benefits, then they would still get the extra $600 add-on. So anyone that is working less than full time should go ahead and apply for regular unemployment insurance. And Marlene, that was actually a very good question. Thank you for asking that so we were able to clarify uh, that answer. And the one issue on the PPP that we're working on, we haven't resolved it yet. We will definitely announce it if and when it gets resolved, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the situation like yours is exactly what we're trying to help fix, which is the PPP loans are a function of how of, of your payroll. The bigger your payroll, the n bigger the number of employees, the bigger the l potential of the loan. The problem with the way the program was set up is that Seasonal businesses in Alaska right now typically don't have a lot of employees, but they would if we had a strong, robust summer season. So what we're trying to do is get Treasury to issue regs to clarify their um, the way in which they view seasonal businesses to enable them to say, you can actually apply for a PPP loan, not based on how many people you have on payroll now, but on an eight-week period between uh, June 1 and uh, September 1 of 2019. If that happens, we will get the word out. We're checking. We're pressing them to do that because then that will enable small businesses that are seasonal that don't have a big number of employees now to have a bigger PPP loan to help them get through this cushion if they can base it on how many employees they had last summer. So we'll keep you posted on that important issue. Okay, thank you. Next up we're going to go to Mrs. Terry Pruitt who has a question for, for the Senator. Hi there. Thank you for taking my call. Um, this I, I had uh, one question and then one comment. Um, my question is for the unemployment commissioner. Um, I own a salon, and we're getting it put back together or in compliance to, so we can get back to work next week. But I have two stylists who are moms. They have kids that are having to be homeschooled, and they're not able to come back to work. They're just, they have to stay there with their kids. And then I have one employee that, um, is medically compromised and she um, is not able to come back to work. Um, is that going to be a problem with them on unemployment? That's an excellent question, Terry, and I'm going to hand that over to Director Westcott. Sir, thank you, Commissioner. So there's not an easy definitive yes or no. Um, every situation is different and it depends on every individual's circumstances. And so what I'm going to go back to is if work exists and an individual has to refuse that work without good cause, then potentially their benefits could be denied. I, I can't give you a definitive yes or no because I don't know each of those individuals' circumstances. 
But what I will say is that our staff will look into their situation. They will take all of those facts under consideration and determine whether or not those individuals had good cause to refuse being able to come back to work. But can I just uh, jump in here, Director Westcott? I, I would imagine that that, uh, what Terry mentioned, is a pretty common question uh, dealing with uh, now uh, people who are employed and might be able to go back to work who have to watch over their kids because there's no school and everybody's homeschooling. Do you think, and again, I'm, I, I don't know what the issues and how the state uh, unemployment system works, but do you think that would be frequently enough uh, asked questions that you guys could get a frequently asked question and maybe make a ruling on it? So it seems to me well, there's probably hundreds of Alaskans who have a similar question, and I think if you know we can be lenient on that one, it might be able to alleviate a lot of the challenges if so many have the same issue. Sure, and I, and I can appreciate everything that you've just said. And again, I cannot give you a definitive answer because every individual's uh, circumstances and situation are different. And so some of the things that we are required under um, the uh, USDO guidance is looking at each individual separately and looking at their circumstances separately. And so for some individuals, they may have no other alternative. For others, there may be alternatives with regard to um, alternative methods of uh, daycare or oversight. And so I, I can't give you a definitive yes or no. It depends on an individual circumstances. But in any case, though, Director Westcott, uh, what you're advising is that the, the application be made uh, for the unemployment benefits and, and give that individual an opportunity to, to establish whether or not they have good cause uh, as to why they could not return to work. And then you are saying that you would review that on a case by case, so it's Senator. It is, yeah, yeah. Senator Murkowski, that, that is that is absolutely what I am saying and recommending. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, thanks. Next up, we're going to go to Larry Taylor, who's got a question for the senators. Um, hi, thank you, Senator Murkowski and Senator Sullivan. Um, I'm a catch can employer with a highly trained summertime workforce uh, here and in Juneau. And uh, uh, so far, it seems like I'm out of luck. I've applied for the PPP and I applied for the $10,000 grant for the EIDL. Um, so due to cancellation of the state's cruise ship uh, smoke emission observation program for the entire uh, summer, um, I'd like to pay some of the wages uh, this summer, keep my technicians, um, and not have to train new people next summer because that's very expensive. Um, if I get the PPP, uh, I now understand I'll not be able to use it because it'll not be forgiven since my employees are not working, so they're not on, on the payroll. And secondly, uh, my company is an LLC, so I'm considered self-employed. Um, and I don't see anywhere where I or my business qualify for um, disaster relief funding uh, to recover what I've spent in training costs for this canceled season, and then I'll have to spend again next year whether I get refunded or not. So those are my two questions. Any thoughts? Well, Senator Sullivan has pointed out the um, the the real uh, omission in the EPP and the limitation in that 
Uh, it fails to recognize um, the seasonality of, of so many of Alaska's businesses, and yours is clearly reliant on, on cruise ships coming in and out. Uh, the, the dates within which um, uh, the, the program is confined in terms of, of when you have to have to have those employees uh, uh, in in on your on your payroll uh, is is limiting, and that has been uh, as as Dan mentioned, that has been something that we've been trying to to work through for for weeks now and um, uh, again we are we are hopeful that we'll be able to get uh, some some regulatory uh, um, forbearance here uh, with regards to this aspect of, of the PPP um, but it it is limiting and it is it has put it has put um, many of our of our more seasonal um, business enterprises at a real disadvantage um, in being able to utilize uh, this PPP. So, uh, my my hope is, and and again, what we've been working on here pretty aggressively, is that the the, the Secretary of Treasury will be true to his word and 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 provide the um, the the regulation that will allow for. Uh, whether it's it's your business operation or, or others to be able to have greater flexibility uh, with with when and how you can you can pay those seasonal employees. Um, I wish that I, I had a had a more clear answer for you at this point in time, um, but we don't have it yet. So Larry, let me let me just jump in here because I think your situation is exactly exactly what we have been. Pounding. I mean, I raised this with the president. I raised it with the secretary of the treasury. Uh, just a couple days ago, I raised it with him again this morning. Um, so, here, but here's what I think, and I, and I don't want to jinx it because if these regs get out or if they get out too slow, um, you know, this is what I've been telling them. We got to get, we got to move, right? But if the one thing that could work is if the if the if the regulation comes out soon that says you can use for your current PPP loan uh, you, the number of employees you had at a certain time an eight week time last summer that's what we're trying to get them to do then your loan would be a lot bigger because your loan's a function of your payroll and then you could pay those 15 employees this summer and then in the eight week period in which you're paying them the loan would be turned into a grant so you would actually still be able to use the PPP in the, the format that most people are most excited about it is if you keep your employees even if they're not doing work and you're paying them and you do that and 75 percent of your loan goes to that payroll, then that loan, at least for the eight-week period, transforms into a grant. So we're trying to get these regs done so you can still do that and keep people employed, even if they're not working that much, and get you the ability to get a bigger loan that can be forgiven and turned into a grant for the eight-week period in which you're paying them. So stand by. We're pressing them every damn day to get these regs out that can help our seasonal workers do that, or seasonal small businesses do that. Thank you, Senator. We, ha we are way over time. We're going to take one last question from Mike Coons. Mike, you're on with the Senator, but please keep it brief. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first thing, you know, we were talking about the amendment that you tried to get through for the um, the unemployment, it kind of goes right into what one of my biggest gripes is, and, and Senator Sullivan, you, you and I have had this discussion before. My understanding of those amendments, that was the 60-vote rule, the filibuster rule aspect, and I think we really need to 
this is way beyond the time now where we really need to go to a nuclear option. Uh, so that's just uh, my, my up comment on that. The, the reason, main reason I'm calling is I'm hearing. Uh, I've got. I, I saw a late, uh, nurse. Uh, on Facebook today, she was talking about she's down in in, uh, in Oregon, and I'm also hearing this is happening up here at Providence, where you have nurses working in the hospital, and they're and they're what they call contract nurses, but yet they're being laid off because they don't have enough patients outside of outside of this this virus to keep to to keep work. So the hospitals are losing money. So then they're 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 firing their nurses, but the nurses are contract nurses, and she, this one one particular nurse was really concerned that she wasn't even going to be eligible for unemployment because she's a contract nurse. The uh, uh, director of Ledbetter or the other director, could you guys help me out with that so I can pass on that information to them? Sure. So this is Director Westcott, and and there's a couple of different uh, complexities to the issue that you just raised. Um, so no, the first being whether or not that individual is really truly self-employed uh, as an independent contractor, or whether they really truly are an employee of the hospital and covered under regular unemployment insurance. In any case, what I would say is though any of those nurses need to go ahead and file for unemployment insurance. It, whether that, whether they, we end up determining that they are an employee of the hospital and should have been covered under regular unemployment insurance or whether we end up determining they really truly are an independent contractor and should be covered under the pandemic unemployment assistance program, either way, they should file for unemployment insurance assistance. 